Hello and welcome to our webinar. I'm very excited to open this webinar. I'm Jacob Bornstein, currently leading the Israel Society for Research and Prevention of Sexually Transmitted Infections. Joining me today are some of my good friends who are also top experts in lower genital tract diseases. We put together this webinar after some friends from around the world offered to help us out during a tough time here. A big shout out to Dr. Jean-Luc Mergui from the IFCPC, International Federation for Cervical Pathology and Colposcopy, and for Dr. Pedro Vieira Baptista, Secretary General for the ISSVD, International Society for the Study of Vulvovaginal Disease, for really pushing for their involvement in today's event. Huge thanks to all our speakers who make the, the time for this. Today, we're all about fighting HPV-associated cancer, inspired by the WHO's initiative to eliminate cervical cancer. Uh, we are looking forward to hearing about the efforts in different countries to make this happen. It's all about sharing knowledge and practical tips we can all use. Now, quick heads up on how things will work during this webinar. <clears throat> if you uh, get a question, uh, just write the questions in the Q&A box below. Uh, also, let us know to which speaker you are asking. After my last talk, we will have a panel discussion to go through your questions. Here is another tip. Right next to the Q&A section, uh, there's a button labeled Show Captions. If you enable it, you'll be able to see the presenter's words as text. It might get a bit garbled at times, but it's worth a try. Just so you know, we are recording this webinar and you will find it later on the websites of all the societies involved. Now I will introduce our esteemed speakers. And I'll, I'll introduce them one after the other. First, Jean-Luc Mergui from France, from Paris. He's the president of the IFCPC, the International Society of Cervical Pathology and Colposcopy. Teresa Freeman Wang from the United Kingdom is with us. She is the president of the British Society of Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology, and also the president-elect of the International Society for Cervical Pathology and Colposcopy, the IFCPC. Also here, Carlos Humberto Perez Moreno from Colombia. Carlos is the past president of the IFCPC and Silvio Tati from Argentine, who is also a past president of the IFCPC. With us also, uh, Dr. Evripidis Bilirakis, a good friend from, uh, from Greece, from Athens. He's a secretary general for the Hellenic Postcopic Society. From Austria comes Dr. Elmar Jura. He is the past president of the European College of Vulvovaginal Disease and a past executive board member of the ISSVD. Dr. Mario Preti from Italy is with us also. He is a past president of the ISSVD. And as I mentioned before, Dr. Pedro Vieira Baptista uh, from Porto in Portugal, who is currently the secretary general of uh, the ISSVD. I will now briefly present the local uh, faculty uh, Dr. Ofer Davidi, uh, he will be moderating the first session. He's Secretary General of the Israel Society for the Study and Prevention of a Sexually Transmitted Infection. Professor Yasmin Maor is the Treasurer of that society. Dr. Ari Rice is the Chair of the Israel Society for Colposcopy and Cervical and Vulvar Pathology. Dr. Gabi Haran is the treasurer of that society, and Dr. Orna Reichman is the secretary of the Israel Society for Colposcopy and Cervical and Vulvar Pathology. Also with us is Professor Tzvi Vaklin, who is the chair of the Israel Society of GYN Oncology, and Professor Rivka Karmi, 
who is the chair of the Israel National Academy for Science in Medicine. So actually, we are representative of, uh, I would say, quite a few, uh, a few societies, and it's, it's a great honor. Uh, and now uh, I will uh, first up hear greetings from the leaders of the societies that uh, are with us today. And I will start by asking Dr. Jean-Luc Mergui from Paris uh, to start and greet us. Dr. Mergui, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jacob, for your introduction and to organize in such a period very hard for Israel to organize such a meeting against uh, cervical disease and more generally HPV-related disease, the cervical, vaginal, and vulvar disease, which are due to HPV. And I think we may have during this afternoon or evening or morning for, for some areas, we'll have a, a very good overview of the problem in Europe, Italy, France, UK, and in South America, which is different area. And I think that when we will finish our session, we'll have a very good overview. And I want, want to thank you very much, Jacob, and to the, the Australian Society, the Australian Society of Colposcopy of Sexually Transmitted Disease, and all your colleagues to organize and to be present during this afternoon. And I think we will have a very interesting, and the role of the IFCPC, as you know, is to favorized exchanges, scientific exchanges during in, in between the nations. And we will have today a very good and very interesting exchange between all the nations you invited to, to be during this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Jacob. And thank you very much for your colleague from your country. Thank you so much, uh, Jean-Luc, and thank you for helping me. Uh, with organizing this session. And, and now, Dr. Pedro Vieira Baptista for the ISSVD. Shalom Alechaim, and I apologize if it, I mispronounced it. I, I trained, but I'm not so sure if it, it went well. I would like to thank Professor Bornstein for inviting the ISSVD and for inviting me to be present in this session. Uh, obviously, HPV is a very important topic. No need to say this to this audience, but these indeed are hard days for Israel. And as we know, we must stay with friends. And uh, that's why it's uh, truly an honor to be here with all of you and also to show a bit of our experience with HPV vaccination in my country. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you very much for your participation, for the ISSVD for helping and participating. It is now my honor to call upon uh, Professor Rivka Karmi, uh, who is the president uh, of uh, the Israeli National Academy for Science in Medicine. Professor Karmi. Uh, dear faculty and audience, welcome. Uh, on behalf of the Israeli National Academy of Science and Medicine by the Israeli Medical Association, an academy of which Professor Borenstein, the co-chair for this conference, is a senior member, I would like to express to you my sincere gratitude. First, as a woman physician, for your presence here to discuss the highly important topic of modern approaches to combating female malignancy caused by HPV. This virus that is causing worldwide more than half a million cases of cervical cancer, but also male's oral pharyngeal cancer, can be best eliminated by increasing compliance of vaccinations among the young. Once inflicted, however, adequate monitoring and targeted treatment of the cancer can effectively and significantly improve prognosis. This webinar, I understand, is further supporting and enhancing the WHO global effort in this regard. And second, I would like to express my appreciation for your participation in an Israel-based webinar in these trying times for the country. As gynecologists and researchers of women cancer, I'm sure you've all uh, were very dismayed and appalled by the atrocious violence exerted on Israeli women on October 7th 
of 2023. Women in Israel were assaulted, raped, mutilated, burned, murdered, and kidnapped as war trophies by these infamous Hamas terrorists. This kind of atrocities against women is unacceptable on any possible level, yet is not unanimously condemned, especially by organizations that are supposed to act on behalf of the best interests and well-being of women. This webinar, however, presents your clinical and scientific commitments to the health and well-being of women wherever they are. And for that, I thank you very much, and I wish you a very fruitful event. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Carmi, for discussing these issues. And uh, now we have uh, Dr. Ari Rice, who is the chair of the Israeli Society of Cervical Pathology, Valvar and Colposcopy. Dr. Rice, please. Uh, in times of crisis, our health often takes a back seat. Yes, it's, yet it's precisely during these moments that advocating for preventing measures becomes paramount. HPV related to cancers do not pose for crisis and neglecting health today compounds challenges tomorrow. Uh, let's empower ourselves amidst uncertainty. Routine screening, vaccinations and awareness initiatives are not mere tasks, they're acts of resilience. By prioritizing preventing healthcare, we strengthen our healthcare systems, making them more resilient in times of need. Before we move on, a heartful thanks to our esteemed international experts who have devoted their time to contribute to their expertise and enriches our collective understanding and accelerates our progress. And a special thanks to Professor Bornstein, whose dedication uh, and organizational prowess have brought us together for this crucial event. Your leadership is steering us forward, uh, impactful discussion and solution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rice. And last but not least, uh, Professor Vaknin, uh, who is the chair of the Israel Society of GYN Oncology. Dr. Professor Vaknin. Good evening, all. Uh, I join my colleagues and thank you all for your willingness to join us in these hard times. We see medicine as the best bridge for doing good for humanity. And HPV-associated cancer elimination is one of our major goals, fighting cancer, which is actually achievable. We hope to see all of you in Israel in the future. Best regards from me and my colleagues in the Israeli Society of Gynecologic Oncology. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present the global experience in progress for cervical cancer elimination. And I will start with the global problem of HPV disease. I don't know why. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Then, as you know, the HPV infection caused about 5% of all cancer worldwide. And this is an estimation, but we think that there is a 600,000 women which has a cancer every year. But also men are involved by HPV cancer-related disease, which is about, it's a, about tenfold less important than the women. Then it's about 60,000 uh, men which are involved by cancer. And we'll see what are those cancer in men in my country. I will present you after that a short presentation of the situation in France. Then we need to improve and to, uh, to fight against cancer due to HPV. And as you know, those cancer, about 600 new cases, goes to 300,000 deaths every year. Then half of the cancer go to the uh, deaths in women which are very young. And the highest rates of cervical cancer incidence, mortality are present in low and middle income countries. And as we see here, for example, in the European region, only 60,000 women are newly diagnosed with a cervical cancer and half of them 
will die for this preventable disease. This is a situation, for example, in Europe, but as you know, all of you, one woman dies of cervical cancer every two minutes in the world, every two minutes, which is a, really a tragedy, as the WHO says in 2018. We know that it's possible to prevent HPV infection. For example, during 10 years, 100 million adolescent girls receive at least one dose of an HPV vaccine, but 95% of those vaccinations are done in high-income countries. Around 30% of low-income countries reporting having pathology service only, 30% have the pathology services and cancer surgery or chemotherapy or radiotherapy to take care of those patients. And in high-income country, 90% of these countries has all those structures to take care of patients. And we'll see that all those problems are mainly present in low- and middle-income countries and less than high-income countries, but high-income countries may have some other problem. And as you see at the last point, Sorry, as a last point, less than 25% of low-income countries have introduced an HPV vaccine into their national immunization schedules. If we see here the repartition of country which has an HPV vaccine in national immunization schedules, we see that high-income countries have this vaccination at 85%, but if you are looking at low-income countries, less than 30%, have a vaccination program of an access to a vaccine. For the screening, screening is done in high-income country for 80% of, of women. But in low-income countries, you may see that screening is less than 40% of patients, which is very, very low, and this is a, a real problem. If we are looking at all the structures which are taking care of cervical disease, pre-cancerous lesion or cancerous lesion, we may see that it's a very important problem. The income country, the low income countries have low level of cancer centers, low level of pathology services, less than 40%, cancer surgery, less than 30%, chemotherapy, less than 30%, and radiotherapy, less than 20%. Then we cannot take care of patient at the same way in high, middle, or low-income countries. That's why WHO presents a proposal for 2030 to have 90% of girls vaccinated, 70% of women which are screened by 35 years old, and 90% of women identify as having a disease to be treated properly but I'm not sure that those proposals that those proposal could be realistic since the next seven years, because in low-income countries, there is a very difficult situation. And we are trying with the IFCPC to improve that and to help the WHO proposal. And I will tell you after, at the last uh, slide how we can help the low-income countries. In France, what is the situation? Since the beginning in 1990, since 2015, then we have a decrease, a very important decrease of invasive cervical cancer incidence. But since 10 years, 2015 to 2024, we have a stagnation of the incidence of cervical cancer. We didn't rise a, a, a decreasing level of invasive cancer. Why? We have an organized screening program in France since 2018 with a cytology every three years, which HPV testing from 30 to 65 years old every five years. We begin the screening at 25 until 30 by cytology and 30 to 65 by HPV testing every five years but our coverage of the population is quite low and doesn't move from the level of 60% of the population. We have an access with, to the vaccination since 2007, 
girls from 11 to 14 years old with two doses and to 15 to 19 years old with three doses and boys are vaccinated in France since 2023, then one year. But our coverage of vaccination is very, very low, and it's a lower coverage in all Europe. Girls almost with almost one dose, less than 40% of young girls has been are being vaccinated. And boys, less than 10%, 8% of boys has been vaccinated in France. And then if we are looking at the incidence of invasive cervical cancer in this slide, we may see that globally the incidence is decreasing for young women, but it's increasing slightly for women of 60 years old and women of 50 years old. Then we have a very light increasing incidence in this group of patients because the coverage of screening is decreasing after the age of 50 years old. If we are looking here on the incidence of precancerous lesion, high-grade lesion, we have since 2010 a, a very light increasing incidence of high-grade lesion not for young patients, but mainly for patients from 25 to 44 and from 44 to 64. And then the global incidence of precancerous lesion is slightly increasing in France since 10 years. And if we are looking what is the situation now in our country, every year we have about 37 800 cases of precancerous or cancerous lesion for women and around 2,000 cancerous lesion for men. What are the, the repartition of lesion? What is the, 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 the lesion? 200 cancer of vagina or vulva, 1,000 cancer of anus in women, only 400 in men, 400 cancer oropharyngeal cancer for women and three times more in men, 1,300. 3,000 invasive cervical cancer, 3,000 of precancerous lesion of the vulva or vagina, and 30,000 30, precancerous lesion of the cervix, which is around 40,000 lesion, high-grade lesion or invasive lesion due to HPV in women, and about 20 fold less in men, then it's mainly a problem for women and the only massive problem for men are oropharyngeal cancer due to HPV. Then the situation is France is a stagnation of invasive cancer incidence, a slight increase incidence of high grid lesion. And then we have to improve our screening coverage by information, call and recall situation, or auto-testing, but we didn't begin at the moment really to, to test the auto-test in our country. And we have to improve, of course, vaccination because we have only 4% uh, of young women vaccinated and it was less than 30% during the last 10 years then we have a very low coverage of vaccination and we are not fighting very well against cervical cancer. And I want to finish my presentation that by saying that we are with the IFCPC trying to organize prevention, screening and treatment of cervical cancer to improve that in the Pan-African Congress, joining all the African countries to because we know that in Africa, about 50% of all the worldwide cancer are detected in this country. And I want you to invite, of course, to our IFCPC webinar. The first one will be on Wednesday, 13 March. It's about endocervical lesions. And I hope you will be present during our next 
World Congress of the IFCPC, which will be in Paris in June 2026. Thank you for your invitation and thank you for having me the opportunity to present the situation worldwide and the situation in France. Thank you, Jacob. Um, yes, so um, apologies. So the, the UK position then is that more than two women die every day in the United Kingdom from cervical cancer and our incidence of cervical cancer is relatively high. So it's 9.4 per 100,000, though in London uh, it is lower. Um, but as you heard from uh, Jean-Luc, um, our incidence is higher than the French. Um, and to eliminate cervical cancer, it needs ideally to be uh, less than four per 100,000. So the graphs are really um, illustrating the, uh, the median, which is in young women in uh, about 35 as the most common age at which cervical cancer uh, happens in um, the United Kingdom. And the uh, lower graph is illustrating the inequalities in healthcare and showing that those that are most uh, deprived um, uh, have a much higher rate, uh, both incidents and deaths from uh, cervical cancer. So our program started in 1988 and we had call and recall since then. In 2020, uh, we moved to um, primary HPV screening, except in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I, um, with all of the kerfuffle with my slides, uh, forgot to mention that the United Kingdom comprises four countries. So we have England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. Uh, and with respect to colposcopy, the Republic of Ireland, all of the colposcopists are also uh, trained and accredited through our British society. Uh, so in uh, across the United Kingdom, uh, we invite women between the ages of 25 and 65. Uh, and uh, other than in Scotland and Wales, that is now doing it every five years, in England and in Northern Ireland, we still invite women between the ages of 25 and 49 uh, every three years, and women uh, aged 50 and over every five years. And what uh, I'm showing you uh, here is that um, uh, for the latest figures that we have, which are to 2018, uh, there were uh, just under 3,200 uh, cases of uh, cervical cancer. So we um, have been successful within our program in the sense that it is now the 19th most common uh, cancer in the United Kingdom, though it remains the second most common cancer in young women. So that's uh, under the age of 44 and is responsible for about 1% of all female cancer deaths. Mortality from or deaths from cervical cancer are relatively low, uh, though uh, clearly for a preventable disease, we would prefer it to be significantly lower or non-existent, but uh, it has been stable for many years at uh, 850 uh, cases per year. But as I mentioned to begin with, that is still more than two women every day dying from a preventable disease. Uh, and the biggest risk factor for uh, cervical cancer in our or across our countries is not being screened. And one of the worrying things from our program is that year on year coverage for cervical screening has been decreasing. And uh, the uh, maps um, of England show you uh, that uh, the dark blue is predominantly good and the light blue and the gray is poor. And what you can see uh, in the slide there is that for London, the vast majority of London has coverage of uh, less than 70%. And indeed, for the country, um, for 2022, coverage uh, was only 68.7%. So essentially, a third of eligible women are not attending for their cervical screening. And that is a concern when one is thinking about eliminating a preventable disease. Uh, what this uh, illustrates is that coverage remains good in the older generation. So in the generation that is used to attending for their screen in the 50 to 64 year olds, that although it's decreased, it has remained under that uh, above that 70% threshold. 
but at all other age groups, it is decreasing and under that threshold. So in th terms of thinking about strategies to eliminate cervical cancer, Jean-Luc uh, talked about uh, the WHO initiative to eliminate it by 2030. Our National Health Service um, put out a document uh, and a strategy in November of 2023. And the aim is to eliminate cervical cancer uh, across uh, our four nations by 2040. And there are three pillars to that approach. So there's vaccination, which clearly is key. And the evidence from Scotland shows that in a vaccinated cohort, uh, the uh, incidence of high grade uh, disease is dropping dramatically. Uh, so we vaccinate both girls and boys. Since September last year, um, it has been a single dose program. We have a catch up program, which is uh, available to young people via their general practitioner. And we uh, have aims to make it available in libraries and pharmacies and community services and online bookings. Screen coverage, I've already mentioned, is a huge issue. Uh, and there are some ongoing studies to look at the place of self-sampling to see if that helps to encourage women to attend. And there are various programs looking at tackling the inequalities and providing information uh, specifically in minority groups and so on, as I've outlined there. And then clearly equally important is when one does screen that if there are abnormalities, that we have a workforce uh, ready and able to offer appropriate treatment for uh, these women. Uh, and uh, for us, for 2022-23, uh, we performed uh, 246,762 colposcopies, uh, and that number has been increasing, particularly since the change to primary HPV testing. With respect to vaccination, the program was doing very well and we had coverage of 80 odd to 90% until COVID uh, and the numbers have not recovered as yet. Uh, so these graphs are showing coverage for boys and girls after a single dose um, across uh, the years. And on average, 76% of girls and 71% of boys uh, have had their vaccine. And these are some of the other strategies uh, that uh, we are working with. So Joe's uh, Cervical Cancer Trust is a charity that uh, provides information and support for uh, women with cervical abnormalities and cancer. And they have a coalition roadmap, um, which is looking at various aspects, including leadership, education, uh, looking at the workforce and the digital uh, platforms that we need to uh, be coordinated across the countries. Um, and to summarise, our aims are to increase the vaccination rates to 90%, to halt the decline in the cervical screening uh, and increase um, the screen rate to at least 70%, to ensure that 90% of women that have an abnormality get treated. Uh, and those um, philosophies and plans have been laid out in a range of documents uh, for us, including our NHS long-term uh, plan, our women's health strategy for England, uh, and we have a women's health ambassador in uh, Dame Professor Leslie Regan, who's the first ambassador for the country to improve women's health. Uh, reducing healthcare inequalities, as I've mentioned, and the uh, roadmap. So with that, I do apologise that you haven't seen the full presentation. I'm not quite certain uh, what happened there, but uh, I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of you, and uh, especially to Jacob and Jean-Luc. I'm going to talk about my country. My country is uh, 50 million People countries similar to Peru and Argentina, less than Mexico or Brazil. And I'm going to talk about the cervical cancer situation, talking about the magnitude of the social and economical burden of unhealthy lifestyles, predisposed cancer and non-communicable chronic disease. And the problem is only a few countries has done a positive stride uh, against the tobacco, the cell diet control, 
and HPV vaccination. Uh, worldwide, the, the, the place where cervical cancer is located is, is in the fourth place. But for our countries, the situation is different. We are uh, above the, the media of the world. Colombia and Mexico are similar, so different than the United States but not so works like so works like Bolivia that where the incidence and mortality are so high and if you compare the incidence in in my country the cervical cancer is in the third place about 2000 deaths per year and the incidence and uh, the probably is a uh, 4,000 new cases per, per year. And in our country, the situation of the cervical cancer is in the third place. And if you see the relationship between the, uh, the development index and cervical cancer incidence, according uh, to many continents, uh, we have in Colombia, is is not so worse, but it's not so good. If you compare uh, Africa is the, the, the worst in incidence and mortality and probably Europe is in the best place. And according to the uh, mortality is the same situation. We are in the probably in the middle of incidence and uh, mortality. Colombia has implemented since two, uh, 2012 a plan for 10 years for the control of uh, the cervical cancer with uh, the modification for many risks for improving early detection, the care, the recovery and overco overcoming damage, improving the quality of life cancer patient and survivors, information system for the decision making and human resources for cancer control is similar to the goals of the WHO goals from uh, 2020. And many, many goals for cervical cancer, the, the most important is to achieve the 80% of the um, population object, uh, the women aged between 25 and 69 start in 2013. But the problem is we can't reach the uh, this 80 percent we do obviously see and treat a strategy in many places but the problem continue and the cervical cancer situation is increasing in my country if we keep doing the same the problem is not in colombia is in the americas and worldwide we are going to have uh, an 25 uh, percent of uh, increase of cervical cancer cases in the in the Americas at least. For that reason, we are joined to the uh, architecture of the elimination of cervical cancer to the uh, WHO. What, what is going on with primary prevention in my country? We are, in, we have a national program in immunization inclusive in October of uh, 2023, we implemented a, a gender uh, vaccination. It, it was uh, an important step for us, but the problem as usual in many countries is coverage. Our coverage for the first doses is low and for the second doses is low, uh, more than the first dose as, as usual. And now we we implemented one vaccination dose from October 2023. In secondary prevention, we are joined obviously with the WHO strategy, but the problem of uh, a country in Latin America uh, like uh, Colombia is we have a, a very big problem from barriers for the cytology screening or HPV screening because half of the country is in the jungle with the little towns, very, very poor little towns close to Venezuela, to Brazil, to 
in, in the borders is where we have the the, the biggest problem problem for for the screening. With that, we add obviously to WHO uh, management guidelines for screening and treatment, and we implemented in the big series the HPV the DNA detection as a as a primary screening test. But the problem is our country is not so rich to to have uh, HPV for everybody. So. Um, in many places of my country, we are based on conventional cytology, uh, either um, liquid-based cytology. For these problems, uh, IFCPC implemented our IFCPC distant learning course. Our uh, distant learning course is, is a, a course with the IARC and it's a structured, progressive, comprehensive, and accessible program. Includes theory, image, images, recognition, case management, and clinical models. Assessed continuously during the course by an, an OXI exam at the end, with a certificate of completion of the course and passing the, the exam. I am going to show some examples, the course in, in English, the course in uh, Portuguese and the course in Spanish, but we have uh, the course in, in, in French Oslo also. This is the uh, content of the course. I am not going to, to, to see all the, the, the course, but you can visit our uh, webpage www.ifcpc.org um, and you can see the course is a uh, very easy and um, is a uh, um, a new course, and uh, is very important for young people and for the older colposcopists who want to to give an uh, uh, an update to their uh, knowledge about uh, cervical pathology. Conclusion and challenges. Among the social determinants of the cervical cancer mortality is the average of number of years of education of the population, income levels, and the difficulty of accessing technologies for prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. The vaccine has been implemented in low and middle income countries with different strategies and problems of acceptability, particularly in Colombia. Few countries, have managed to implement the new screening strategies for HPV. For low and middle income countries uh, and regions, visual inspection techniques are an important uh, alternative. The new molecular technologies generate challenges in the management of guidelines and in the quality of uh, colposcopy. And some important tools are now available for improving cervical cancer prevention, boost secondary prevention, testing the presence of HPV uh, in cervical specimens and treating HPV-induced lesions, introduce primary prevention by immunizing against a select group of onco oncogenic HPV types. And nowadays, strategies that combines HPV vaccination and HPV screening have to be evaluated. And the final question is, uh, it is possible to eliminate cervical cancer in the medium term proposed by WHO? I say it's very difficult for countries in Latin America because the first 90% that is vaccination, we are so far, to achieve the goals. In uh, many countries in Latin America, for the first dose are between 40 and 60%. So with this strategy, we never reach the 30% of reduction in uh, 2030, at least for uh, Latin American countries. Thank you very much for your attention. and. It, is, it was a great opportunity to participate and to show uh, my country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this kind invitation. 
and my personal support to Israel in this hard situation. We are going to talk about HPV vaccination in Argentina. An update is the epidemiolog epidemiological situation in Argentina. We have about 4,000 new cases each year and uh, 2,500 deaths each year. So the index of death is that the stage of uh, diagnosis of cervical cancer in Argentina is, is stage three or four, very advanced stage with a high incidence of death. So let me show you the incidence of vulvar, vaginal, and anal cancer in Argentina, because we have a multicentric approach of the HPV infection. This is the numbers of the vulvar cancer in Argentina. And you can see here after 50 years old, begin to, uh, uh, begin to uh, increase the incidence of vulvar cancer. And what we see in the last 10 years is that the increase is of the VIN, the pre-cancer lesions related to uh, HPV. So the same as the vaginal cancers and uh, this vaginal cancer increasing after 40 years is always related to a previous treatment of CIN3. So this is a special population that we need to follow up a screen. And this is the anal cancer. As you can see here, the females are more important in the incidence of uh, uh, anal cancer as in males, and we need to screen anal cancers in males who are diagnosed for CN3, and the vaccine is very important. And uh, you know the vaccine uh, is against 16 and 18, which is the etiology of 90% of anal cancer. But let's go to the Argentine HPV vaccination program and make some history. We begin to vaccinate uh, girls in 2011 and we begin with the bivalent vaccine. And then in 2014, we changed to the quadrivalent vaccines. And in 2017, we introduced the males and we introduced the neutral gender vaccination, which is very, very important. We are now vaccinating boys and girls at 11 years old, and we are thinking to begin to vaccinate at nine years old, as is happening in the UN, United States just now. And this is a special situation. We vaccinate under 26 years old in the national health program with a patient with HIV, transplant host, oncology or oncomatologic history, and immune disease or sexual abuse. And it's what's happening in Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, Panama, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. So, which is the our goals? The goals is to articulate the strategies in between the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education, with regional meetings, follow up by province, and promote health control and vaccination in school. This situation in a low middle income countries and Argentina is very, very important to perform adherence to vaccination. So the numbers are the numbers. And let me show you what happened when we began and today. Then when we begin in 2011, we have a coverage of 88% in the first dose, 72% for the second dose, and 53% for the first dose. We begin with three doses. In 2015, we changed to two doses in between 11 and 14 years old. And the other is 23, 83% for first dose and 50 for the second dose. As we know, the second dose is very difficult, but we begin with the Boys, what happened when we begin in 2017? As you can see, for the first dose, only 57%, and for the second dose, 21%. And what happened before the pandemic? For the boys, 78 and 49, which is very, very good. 
But you know, the impact of COVID-19, 70% of the country's disruptions to vaccinate on outreach service, 76 reduction in outpatient care attendance, and 61% of facility-based service disruptions. So this is very important to know. And what happened? The rates drop and the HPV vaccines down 21%, which is the, the huge drop. Then you can see TDP vaccination down 20% and meningococcal drop 16%. This is really important because we never recover for the pandemic. We recover in 2022. And these are the numbers of 2022. Here you can see the first dose in 2019, 87%, and in 2022, 82% for the first dose. In 2019, for the first dose, 78%, and in 2022, 75%. For the second dose, in 29, 59% in 22, 54%. In the boys, 49% and 47% in the 22. So we are slow recovering for the pandemic, but with, with uh, rates of 80% for the first, first dose in, in girls and about 55% for the first dose in boys. So the challenge, is improve coverage and recover schemes, avoid missed vaccination opportunities, generate articulate a strategy to improve vaccination, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, school-based vaccination, and at the end, simplified vaccination schedule. So the five steps to improve HPV vaccination rates, learn, inform, communicate, recommend and vaccinate. This is crucial. So other thing is to introduce neutral gender vaccination. Gender neutral vaccination is beneficial in terms of the burden of the HPV related disease, cost effectiveness and gender inclusivity. The lessons learned in the implementation of the gender neutral vaccination across Argentina could also inform to scale up of similar programs to other similar socioeconomic settings with universal health coverage. But numbers, again, are numbers. And let me show you these papers published recently in Papilloma Research that show you the strong reduction in prevalence of HPV 16 and 18 and other HPV types and closely related HPV types in sexually act active adolescent women following the introduction of HPV vaccination in Argentina. As you can see here, in yellow, you can see the non-vaccinate and in blue, the vaccinate. And follow the numbers, you can see after the vaccine, how it drops the incidence of 16 and 18. But if you want to see another result, you can see that either 16 and 18, but with 31 and 45. This is very important because 16 and 18, it's about in Argentina, 70% of all the theology of cervical cancer. But if we add 31 and 45 by our own numbers produced with Xavier Bosch with the uh, Instituto Catalan de Oncology. It means that we cover about 75, 77 of the theology of cervical cancer in Argentina. And we need to see what happened with other cancer as we show at the first slide, vulvar cancer, vaginal cancer, anal cancer, and we need to introduce oropharyngeal cancers. We still don't have the results. So this is very important. In the pre-vaccination era, 
the HPV 16 is 11%, in the 2020, 0.8%. In the 18 HPV types, 6%, and the 2020, 0.4%. For the 31, is 7.1%, and the 2020, 1.6%. For 45, 4.6%, and in the 2020, 0.5%. And for the 33, 3.1%, and the 2020, 1.7% which is a huge drop of the incident of HPV for the new generations in Argentina. Boys, this is girls, and we hope the same in boys and girls. So the new challenge, we introduce in our national health calendar of vaccination, one dose of the nanovalent vaccine for the 2024. Let me show you that at 11 years of follow-up, there were no difference in prevalent HPV 16 and 18 infection between the one, two, and three dose groups. HPV serum antibodies levels in the single dose group have remained stable for 11 years at the level that is approximately one quarter of that of three dose, but greater than that of natural immunity it suggests that lower antibodies do not necessarily mean lower protection. Then we want, we want to know what happened in the long term with one dose, but what we need just now to uh, introduce in the WHO scheme to eliminate cervical cancer in Argentina. We need to increase the coverage and one dose, we know that we can arrive to the 90% of coverage in boys and girls very fast. Thank you for this kind invitation. So we're talking to talk about the elimination of cervical cancer in Greece. Here, I hope the translation is okay. On behalf of the Hellenic Society for Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology, I would like to send my greetings to Ephraim Sinclair Zvivaknin, the organizing committee, and all Israeli colleagues. Personally, I would like to send warm regards to the president of the webinar, my dear friend and also good friend of my country, Jacob Bernstein, for the honor to participate in this webinar. I wish peace and health to all of you, your families, and the people of Israel. <clears throat> in Greece, we have approximately 500-600 cases of cervical cancer per year and 250 deaths. The cancer registry is not fully accomplished and the data from the incidence and prevalence of cervical cancer in Greece or the therapeutic interventions are based on estimations. You see here that concerning the age 20 to 29, we have 20 cases per year and concerning the age from 30 to 65, we have approximately 500 cases per year. The Hellenic Society for Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology was founded in 1985 and currently has around 120 members who have been registered after examinations as certified colposcopists. The registration in diagnostic colposcopy is a prerequisite, but for continuing to be a certified member, it is compulsory to attend a recognized by HSCP conference every three years. Our society is allied with EFC and IFCPC. In Greece, we align with the World Health Organization 2030 control targets. Recording in progress. 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 HSCP officials, in collaboration with the Greek Obstetrics and Gynecology Society, the Greek Society of Clinical Cytology, the Hellenic Cervical Pathology Academic Research Group, and the Hellenic Society of Pathology, have been invited by the National Public Health Organization since 2013 as official advisors and have expressed 
their views regarding the actions to be taken in the field of issuing guidelines for the cervical cancer screening and triage. These are the guidelines issued by the Greek Society for, of Gynecology in 2020. Cervical cancer screening should begin when a woman turns the 21st year of age, except in cases of immunosuppressed individuals. For women aged 21 to 30, pap smear, LBC preferably, is recommended every three years. And in the age group over 30, code testing combining cytology and HPV, mRNA or DNA test is recommended every three years. In 2021, the Spiros Doxiadis screening program project was announced focusing first at the level of primary prevention and second at the level of secondary prevention. First, the national vaccination program addresses to special and vulnerable groups of the population, children, migrants and adults, mobile populations and populations at risk. And concerning the strategic objective two for secondary prevention, early detection of high prevalence diseases and the implementation of the national screening program in the general population. Funding of the screening for cervical cancer based on this strategic objective provides receiving a test at a depth of three years in 50% of women 21 to 65 years. In our country, unlike most developed countries, there is a steady upward trend in cancer deaths in both men and women. In women, according to unofficial data, only 25 to 30% of Greek women who should have a pap test are tested regularly. The screening program includes preventive actions such as the establishment of preventive approved diagnostic tests for cervical cancer, information and awareness actions. And now from 2022, we have the screening program guidelines, regardless of whether they have been vaccinated or not. For women in the general population from the age of 21, it is recommended to have a pap smear every three years. For women in the general population from the age of 30 and for women with HIV from the age of 25, it is recommended to have a regular screening with highly reliable laboratory high-risk HPV test, HPV DNA or HPV mRNA every five to 10 years, followed by treatment immediately or as quickly as possible in people diagnosed with abnormalities. Women diagnosed HIV positive should be tested more frequently every three to five years. And this is the algorithm. For the screening, there are some specifications requirements. The test should be FDA approved for 14 HR HPV viruses, and we use the LBC thin prep vial. In the event of finding HR HPV types other than 1618, a cytological evaluation is provided. In the event of finding 16 or 18 HPV types, patient is referred for colposcopy. And now let's talk about the National Vaccination Program. The National Vaccination Program includes vaccination against HPV. Gardasil-4 and Cervarix were introduced in 2007 and Gardasil-9 was introduced in 2017. The nine-valent HPV vaccine is available in our country and is administered mainly by private practitioners, pediatricians, gynecologists, and health centers personnel. HPV vaccination is recommended for boys and girls aged 9 to 11. In case the vaccination is not done at the recommended age, it can be replenished up to the age of 18. The HPV vaccine is fully reimbursed 
for boys and girls aged 9 to 18, and the limitation in reimbursement does not apply to the groups of increased risk. And these are this is the group of increased risk persons. Between 2017 and 2021, the average vaccination coverage among girls was estimated at 55% for ages 11 to 18 and 44% for ages 11 to 14. The most common age of vaccination in the year 2017 was 30 years, 13 years, while in 2021 it was 12 years. During the time period of the COVID-19 pandemic, 20 to 21, there was a downward trend in overall HPV vaccinations among girls. It is noted that the coverage indicators are far from the percentage that the World Health Organization sets as a vaccination goal until the year 2030. So, the cons of the Greek reality. First, we have opportunistic screening. We do not have the system call recall. Cancer registry is not fully accomplished yet. Sometimes pap test is considered by some people and unfortunately by some doctors as a catch-all and has become synonymous to a complete gynecological checkup. We have the use of non-approved HPV tests by some laboratories. We also have some problems with triage. That means that the management is not always conducted by a certified colposcopist. We also have obstetrical morbidity after over treatments. No need to do. And we also have low vaccination coverage. But uh, we also have pros in the Greek reality. Now we have European sources funding for the National Public Health Organization Cervical Cancer Screening Program. We have vaccination coverage, which is raised the last years, covering boys and girls. We use FDA approved LBC in our country, ThinPrep. Mainly, most of the laboratories use FDA approved HPV DNA or mRNA assays. And we have the registration in diagnostic colposcopy. Thank you for your attention. It's a pleasure to be here to to show you our data. Usually, our country we tend to have poor data. We have we are probably not probably. Unfortunately, we are the the Western European country with the worst rates of cervical cancer. But one thing we are doing right is vaccination, and there's a, a some history behind this we and it's a quite a long history it started uh, at least in 1965 when the, we started a national universal free accessible to all residents regardless of being citizens or not of vaccination and this plan has been ongoing uh, ever since it's updated as needed according to the new data. It's available in all primary healthcare centers and everyone is supposed to be registered in one of these public and free healthcare centers where they have their GPs, all the, where the they can have all the primary care. And despite having this need to be registered in one of these centers, you can have your vaccines in any of these places, uh, regardless of whether or not it is the one in which you are registered. Um, this plan is highly recommended, but not mandatory, except for the vaccine for tetanus and diphtheria, diphtheria, which according to the law is mandatory for those attending school or to take exams at school. Nevertheless, 
the constitution says that schooling is a, a right, it's a universal right. So in practical terms, none of these vaccines is mandatory. While one law says it is mandatory, it, you have the right and it's mandatory to go to school. So if the parents refuse to have vaccination for that child, they are entitled to. So it's a, a legal controversial topic. This is the last version of our vaccination plan. And how do things work? Well, every and um, since uh, once a, a child is born, she has she, uh, that child is entitled to be registered in one of these centers and is in those lists. And so the, the nurses will call and recall if there are no shows for vaccination. This is our plan for HPV. We started vaccinating with, uh, with Gardasil in 2008. We started with 13-year-old girls and when the catch-up phase for those who were 17 years old. In 2014, we reduced to two doses of still Gardasil at that time and only for girls. In 2017, we changed it to Gardasil 9 and still was only for girls. And since 2020, we started vaccinating also boys. High rates of vaccination is not a, a new thing in our country. We made the uh, headlines during the COVID because we also reached really high levels. And uh, in fact, if we see the, the expected coverage rate for all vaccines is of 95% and we achieve it for all vaccines. The, um, the cutoff is slightly lower for the HPV vaccine in which it, it was established to be at 85%. And we achieved it and um, apparently COVID had little to no impact uh, in this. Uh, for the first dose, it uh, coverage rate is very high for both boys and girls at 92 and 91% respectively. For the second dose, it seems to be lower, but probably it's a bit early to, to reach conclusions. For the second dose, we have 89% for girls and 80% for boys. And it stopped. Yeah. So what, in our opinion, what explains this success? This history of an organized vaccination plan the existence of an organized public health system, which is free and available to, to everyone, not only for citizens, anyone who is resident in the country is entitled to it. The system in which the parents or the adult will receive a message or a phone call to, to go to get the vaccines. Uh, healthcare professionals still do have some credibility, contrary to politicians. There's a widespread belief that vaccines are mandatory. That's not really the case, but uh, most people do believe that they have to, to do it. The, I think there have been good communication strategies uh, from the health ministry uh, in terms of vaccination, how important it is, how good it is for the individual and global health. I think some cultural factors may also play a role, like when you say that if you are vaccinating, you are protecting your child. And for instance, for the flu, you are protecting your parents, your grandparents. I think it plays a lot uh, on people's minds and uh, probably contributes to the overall high rate of coverage of vaccines. And we are lucky to have a low impact of anti-vaxxers uh, at the moment. We already can see this effect in when we compare cohorts of vaccinated versus unvaccinated women. We see that uh, similar to what we've seen before in Argentina, we have a 90% uh, drop in the rate of HPV 16 and 18 in the cohorts that were vaccinated at younger age. The ones that, that were vaccinated in that catch-up phase, the reduction was not so obvious. But nevertheless, I think we still face risks. The anti-vaxxers movements tend to grow and to gain weight, especially due to social media. These days, it's really easy to spread the, these messages. We need to keep uh, measures of uh, strong vaccination and screening campaigns and policies for immigrants. We have uh, currently a very high number of, of immigrants. We are a small country, we are around 10 million. 
but uh, 10%, according to the last data that we have from 2023, 90% of the population are immigrants, most of them coming from Brazil, and in these women, the, the vaccination with HPV vaccine is quite, uh, quite low. So we are now facing, we have different cohorts. We have non-vaccinated women. We have women that were vaccinated at 17, women that were vaccinated at 10 with three doses, with two doses. And adding to this, now we have a huge group of women that are at risk and that were not vaccinated. And this obviously is putting quite some stress in, a, in our healthcare system, which is not actually living it, its best moment. Um, this is a different perspective, and that's one thing I'm proud of. In my hospital, we started in June 2022, a program in which we offer, uh, we, the hospital, the state, offers uh, the vaccine for women who have a diagnosis of high-grade lesion of the anogenital tract. And this is a project uh, that we started, that it's being followed now by some, some hospitals. It's not a generalized thing yet in the country, unfortunately, but we believe uh, it will be one day. So the, in terms of conclusions, the HPV vaccine coverage is actually slightly lower than it is for other vaccines in our country. It's uh, slightly higher in girls than in boys. I'm not so sure our model is replicable in other countries. I think cultural factors play a role. There are historical reasons. There's a free health system. And we can never assume our results are taken for granted. We are permanently at risk. We must always be on watch as these things can really can change really fast. We are the... We, as experts in the country who were discussing that we definitely should need we needed to change the screening entering age. We we were pretty sure that we could start at age 30 to our eye coverage. These days I'm starting to have doubts as we have many young women uh, with a different profile not vaccinated. And uh, that's what I had to tell you. Thank you. I will start with the results we have with the first quadrivalent vaccine, which was licensed in 2006. And looking at the results for vulva vaginal disease, and especially high-grade disease of the vulva and the vagina, we saw a 100% reduction of lesions related to HPV 16 and 18. And in this region, almost exclusively HPV uh, 16 is causing the lesions. Meanwhile, we have moved in most countries to the nine valent vaccine and comparing the results of the nine valent vaccine with a historic placebo cohort, we observed the reduction of 95% of uh, disease of the vulva and the vagina and just looking at high grade disease there was even a hundred percent reduction of disease uh, related to the nine vaccine types of the vulva and the vagina you all know this graph from the new england journal the uh, significant reduction of cervical cancer uh, in confirmed by uh, results from Denmark and England and just a few days ago from Scotland. Uh, so we don't have data on invasive vulva cancer uh, and the reduction after vaccination, but we can make an estimate. Uh, looking at HPV uh, 16 and uh, the other types uh, causing the cancer, we can see that uh, almost all the types can be prevented by the vaccine. Uh, the majority of uh, vulva cancer is still HPV negative, but in those being HPV 
positive uh, HPV-16 is again by far the most dominant type followed by HPV-33. Uh, but we already have results of the reduction of uh, vulvar vaginal precancer on the population level from Denmark. So they have excellent registries. And like uh, the results of the cervix and cervical precancer, it has also been demonstrated in Denmark that. Uh, Early vaccination reduces around 90% of the lesions, of the high-grade lesions of the vulva and the vagina. So, uh, what is with those already being affected with disease? Uh, we could demonstrate uh, within the phase three trial of the quadrivalent vaccine that uh, vaccinating women uh, with disease reduces the risk of recurrence. And just looking at the results for the vulva and the vagina, we observed a more than 40% reduction of recurrent disease of the vulva and the vagina. Just looking at the four vaccine types of the quadrivalent vaccine, there was a reduction of almost 80% observed. And it also uh, gives a benefit on other locations. So looking at the cervix in the follow-up of those women being treated for vulvovaginal disease, we observed a reduction of more than 40% of both low-grade and high-grade disease of the cervix. So a clinically relevant benefit. There's also one prospective study which was done in Italy in the region of Tuscany looking prospectively at uh, the vaccination after the treatment for high-grade lesions of the vulva. Unfortunately, it's not randomized. So women were offered to take the vaccine and they could decide but comparing the recurrence rates in those being vaccinated, they were below 20% and one third of those not being vaccinated had a recurrence within the observational period. So summarizing the data we have today uh, about the prevention of uh, vulva and vaginal cancer and pre-cancer, so we know that the vaccination programs are highly effective, especially when we do which like Portugal. And we know that we have a good protection against vulvar vaginal disease. And we also see a reduction in recurrent disease, although the data are limited, but it's practice also in our institution to recommend HPV vaccination to those women. I uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention and I'm very proud to be part of this webinar and shalom to everyone. First of all, let me thanks our friend, Professor Jacob Borstein for his kind invitation in this hard time for the world in general and for Israel in particular. We have to stay together with you. Thank you again, dear Jacob. Well, is it possible to eliminate uh, barbar cancer? Where are we now? We know from the epidemiologists that uh, barbar cancer is a rare cancer. Over uh, about 20 million of new cancer cases in 2020, only less than 5,000 5, are barbar cancer, but it can be prevented in part. And in particular, barbar cancer among the gynecological cancers had the longest diagnostic delay. So we can do better for women. 
you see among uh, about uh, 170 day delay of uh, diagnostic. And uh, from the uh, statistical, we know that it, there is an increase of viral cancer, in particular, uh, about 1% every year of increase. And in uh, this recent study from Italy, we see that the increase of viral cancer is almost all of the younger uh, cohort. So we can see better in the next slide how the cohort, the younger women, are at an increased risk, in particular, as uh, uh, Professor El Mandura told us, the HPV related viral cases. Because we know that knowledge and prevention before cure. And so we know that there are two different pathway of vulvar cancer, the HPV related and the HPV unrelated. And as we have two different uh, invasive cancer, we have two different intrapetelial lesions, the HPV associated that can be prevented with the HPV vaccination is uh, uh, for younger women with better prognosis with less frequent and less rapid progression. And uh, the HPV independent uh, pathway to vulvar cancer from epithelial lesion in older women with a worse prognosis and frequent recurrences with more frequent and more rapid progression. This is a typical HPV related in epithelial neoplasia. And this is a typical HPV unrelated, independent in a field of lichen sclerosis, which can be prevented with vaccination and can be prevented with diagnosis, early diagnosis of lichen sclerosis and a treatment of differentiated EIN. Thanks to Professor Borson for this slide. We see that there is also a pathological issue is more difficult to diagnose differentiated DIN where the atypia is limited to the basal layer of the uh, skin. And not all, all the vulvar intrapetelial neoplasia are the same because the risk, cumulative risk of cancer is quite higher for differentiated DIN within few years after diagnosis. So we have a field of lichen sclerosis and differentiated DIN. And the same here, lichen sclerosis and differentiated DIN in this other patient, lichen planus and differentiated DIN. And lichen sclerosis, lichen planus, that stratify the risk uh, for invasive cancer need to be stratified for age. The older the patient, the higher risk to develop cancer. Of course, we need long follow-up period for this patient. And we know that uh, with treatment of lichen sclerosis, it's recommended regular topical therapy to reduce the risk to develop cancer in lichen sclerosis affected patients. And uh, we just uh, heard from Elmar the uh, prevention of HPV-related uh, vulvar high-grade intrapetelial neoplasia, HPV-related. Some clinical picture of the HPV-related that can be prevented with HPV vaccination. And why prevention is so important? Because patient with uh, vulvar cancer and vulvar uh, intrapetelial lesion as a, a lower quality of, of life is reported a scientific study with uh, uh, not only dyspareunia but and uh, sexual dysfunction, but anxiety for re revealing their body and fear of recurrence and development of cancer. We need, and uh, thanks to this webinar, to uh, our congresses and courses, we have to promote awareness is the first step to reduce the risk of cancer. And uh, from a, a study from Italy, we know that very few women uh, perform vulvar cells examination and a few women who find the lesion seek for healthcare professionals help. 
and uh, just publishing of the Journal of Lower Genital Tract Disease, where Professor Borstein is uh, uh, editor in chief, we have uh, known that uh, our residents are not so skilled about uh, lower genital tract pathology. So we need to have better lesson during the residence period. Because knowledge is powered, but only when knowledge is shared. And we never must, we must never be afraid to go too far because trust lies beyond. From Marshall Plus. Thank you again, my dear friends. My topic is elimination of HPV associated cancers in, uh, in Israel. Uh, I will start by introduction, very short introduction. So what you see here is a consensus position paper uh, about the strategy for the elimination of tumors caused by HPV in Israel. We set, sit, set together, <clears throat> those logos belong to various Israeli societies. For example, uh, the Israel Society for the Study and Prevention of Sexually uh, Transmitted Infections, the Israeli Society for Infectious Diseases. Uh, we also had the Israel Society for a Colposcopy, uh, Pediatrics, uh, and the Israel Society for GYN Oncology. Um, and we also had the four HMOs in Israel. We all uh, came together to prepare this consensus position paper because after the uh, WH initiative, in Israel, the Minister of Health took very good uh, steps, but we didn't have a consensus paper. So uh, we sat together and prepared one. And at the end of my presentation, I will talk about a few of our recommendations. Now, let, let me give you a perspective of the HPV-associated morbidity and mortality in Israel. So in Israel, the uh, incidence of cervical cancer is 5.64, uh, of course, uh, not the highest uh, in the region, uh, but altogether, as you see here, we have 11.88 per 100,000 HPV associated cancer, and uh, in men, uh, 7.36, which altogether is quite high. Uh, one of the issue in Israel is the mortality is relatively high. Uh, while when we're talking about incidence, we are uh, we are very low. Uh, we are included in Western Asia, so we are like the last, the the, the lowest rate in the world. But if you talk about more mortality, we are higher. So the mortality rate is still high maybe because of the lack of um, uh, tending to screening, or maybe because the low rate of uh, vaccination, which I will talk now. So what about screening in Israel? 70% uh, is the rate uh, by the WHO. Uh, here in Israel, cervical cancer screening is included in the healthcare services basket for women aged 25 to 65. That means that they do not need to pay for that. Uh, all four health maintenance organizations employ now HPV screening methods as their screening approach. Nevertheless, the approach to screening here in Israel is opportunistic as a national organized screening program has not been implemented. So when we compare the uh, compliance with cervical screening to the United States in green and to uh, the United Kingdom, we can still see that we are the lowest among uh, all these. And one of the reason again is because we do not have a national screening program. Let's talk about immunization first at school. So 90% is the aim of the WHO in order to uh, achieve uh, elimination. Unfortunately, in Israel, although we have a very high um, compliance with other vaccination at first graders and at eight graders with HPV, uh, the compliance for the first dose is 64.9 and for the second dose, it's only 51.7. These are the last, last data from last year. 
And if we try to uh, uh, divide it and understand why we have such a low rate or low compliance of vaccination, let's first divide it by areas. So this is the north area where there is a high compliance. But in Jerusalem, for example, there's a very low uh, compliance. Probably the reason is because in Jerusalem, there's a higher concentration uh, of Orthodox Jews, Haredic. In the south, there's an issue with the nurse, nurses, not enough nurses to, um, to give the injections. But altogether, we see uh, that it is only 51.7 for the second dose. We are giving two doses up to the age of 15 uh, as of now. If we further go in, we see that in the secular, secular sector uh, of the schools, actually there's, uh, I would say, a high rate, uh, a relatively high rate uh, of vaccination. However, in the religious sector, it's lower. And in the ultra-Orthodox, the Haredic sector, it's only 8% for first dose and 6% for the second dose. So definitely, definitely there is a lower rate of uh, coverage in, in religious, highly religious sector. And I wonder if this is the same with your countries. We'll discuss that. By the way, in the United States, uh, they have already uh, found that there's an 11-fold decrease in HPV vaccine completion rates among states with a higher percentage of religious adults. They ask people, what is your uh, religion? Uh, are, you, are you Orthodox or less Orthodox? And here in dark is those uh, countries where most people uh, declare that they are highly Orthodox. And in this country, there is a lower rate of vaccination. So uh, I would say that religiosity, the more religious you are, or the more orthodox you are, uh, the less um, vaccination you get. What do we do in Israel about that? So this is a challenge for us. We discussed that with a Pua. Pua is an institute in Israel uh, that uh, deals with fertility and medicine in accordance to the halacha. In the halacha, uh, they uh, try to avoid vaccination at age 14, like we give it in Israel, because this is the... Uh, the, the puberty age, and they don't want to deal with issues that have to do with the, with the relations in this age. Um, so what did they say? In consultation with leading rabbis and senior physicians, they recommend to administer the vaccine in fourth grade. And I am happy to say that uh, recently, the uh, Vaccine uh, Council accepted our position, and uh, starting last year, hopefully, we will give the vaccine uh, at the fourth grade. Uh, by the way, one dose at fourth grade, the second dose will be the eighth grade. By the time they will uh, arrive to eighth grade, we will see if one dose is enough, but probably they will get uh, the second dose at the eighth grade. Uh, the Orthodox people also uh, were impressed by the data of HPV affecting fertility. There are many, um, many reports. Uh, my group has performed a meta-analysis, and what we found is that the prevalence of HPV sperm infection was estimated at 16% of the population of infertile patients. Probably the HPV comes from epithelial cells that end up uh, in the sperm. But anyway, once a sperm is infected with HPV, you see there is a decrease in the motility, for example, and HPV infection lowers sperm count, motility, and morphology. Here you see that it also increases the spontaneous miscarriage rate. Uh, another issue, so this is very important, uh, uh, the other issue with HPV and fertility is that once you develop a precancer and and there's a need to, to, to um, do a loop excision that may, in the long run, decrease fertility because of premature, uh, premature uh, deliveries and, uh, and late abortions. So this also affects the, uh, the uh, Orthodox population, uh, and they indeed want to get in, uh, uh, vaccinated, but in an earlier age. 
Moreover, initiating the HPV vaccine series at age 9 is advocated not only by the ultra-Orthodox, but by many organizations, for example, the American Cancer Society, who recommend HPV vaccination started at age 9. And I'll remind that in more, most countries, the vaccine is registered since age 9. It's given later, but we can start giving it a, at age 9. Some of the benefits of starting vaccination at age nine is that more adolescents start and finish vaccine series on time while they're on school. Because if they start later, they may end up or leave school before they uh, complete the vaccination uh, uh, schedule. There is a stronger immune response to the HPV vaccine as we are younger. So it's better to give it at nine. Increasing likelihood of vaccinating prior to the first HPV exposure, which is earlier and earlier these days. Uh, for the uh, Orthodox uh, community, fewer questions about sexual activity are asked at age 9, much before puberty, than at age 14, uh, in the middle of uh, puberty. Fewer shots per visit. Uh, as younger you are, you get less uh, injections. It is highly acceptable, acceptable uh, to system providers and parents at this age. I want to talk now a little bit about adult vaccination, because if we go back to the vaccination coverage in Israel, I showed you uh, how it differentiate from a country, from a town to town. But you see that over the years, we got up to 65% in 2016. It dropped a little bit because of some fake news, but we never, uh, we never came back to this uh, rate. And it looks like to me that we have a glass ceiling. We arrived at this, uh, uh, at this compliance in school, but we cannot go over it. Despite all our efforts in uh, uh, discussing it and explaining the importance of the vaccination, of course, we can do more and we will do more. But for some reason, we are stuck at this uh, percentage, like a glass ceiling. So we thought about that those uh, uh, pupils, those students, when they reach 18, let's give them the option to be uh, vaccinated. And uh, you know the data that show that the vaccine is uh, effective even after age 18, even after HPV exposure. So why not using it? So uh, we... Uh, Get, we received from the Ministry of Health uh, the opportunity to vaccinate from 18 to 26. Unfortunately, it's every year, uh, like a catch-up. Uh, so, and we ask that to be uh, continuous, to give the vaccine uh, to all adults from 18 to 26. And we also recommend the catch-up practice uh, to vaccinating age 18 to 26. Um, let's see how many vaccinated when the uh, Ministry of Health introduced it to the health basket. So in the 2021, the first year that the Ministry of Health introduced the catch-up practice, only 9,000 9, were vaccinated. This is ex extrapolating from two HMO data. More than 2022 and in 2023, 20,000 vaccinated. That's why we want the catch-up to continue because unlike other countries where the vaccination in school reaches 90%, we are still low. So we can build upon the catch-up practice. By the way, 84 to 87% of the vaccinated are women. So men need to be educated too. <clears throat> there are some issues when we investigated why and uh, what happened when somebody at this age get a prescription. So only 40%, 40 percent of the prescription actually were not redeemed. Only 60 percent took the uh, prescription from the physician and went to get it. Uh, a drop of 20 percent between the first and second dose and a drop of 20 percent from the second to third dose. At this age, we give three doses. So definitely we need to work on the vaccination journey to make it easier. For example, let the nurse uh, prescribe and vaccinate. Actually, no need for the physician to, to prescribe. This may help. <clears throat> Remember, at this, uh, this was free of charge. 
they could get a vaccine at this age uh, without paying. And still, there was a drop from one to second to third. So we also recommend the HPV faster. We are trying to introduce it, uh, the, Bosch, the, the Bosch idea. Uh, so every woman who comes at 25 to get the first screening, we start screening at age 25 with HPV test, recommend the vaccination to her. Uh, the, the HPV screening is free and the vaccination at this age is free. And then you continue. If she has not been vaccinated, you can offer the vaccination later. Uh, those uh, 90 to 95 percent of those will be HPV negative. So, of course, the HPV vaccine will be protecting for them as if they received it when they were younger. And the 5 to 10 percent who are HPV positive also benefit from the vaccine. As El Mayura just showed, that the HPV vaccine um, after treatment in the vulva, vagina, but also in the cervix is very beneficial. So we recommended the HPV faster. So in Israel, because of the 50% rate of vaccinating uh, the, the boys and girls at school, we are hoping that the uh, adult vaccination uh, will take up the issue. And as you know, HPV faster is helping because this is the, the fastest way to receive elimination. So let me go back to the strategy that we uh, wrote according to all these considerations. I won't bother you with all our recommendations, but here are some. The first is that the goal for the complete vaccination rate by 2030, probably it will be later, should be at least 90% for both girls and boys. One of the questions I like to pose to uh, the STEAM panel is that we are having a gender neutral vaccination for some years. Should we stay on a 90% goal or go down to 80%? We'll talk about that. Uh, we didn't want to change the WHO criteria, so we left it so far on 90%, but that can be still discussed. We also wanted to promote a long-term plan, continue including the HPV vaccine to the health basket at age 18 to 26 to allow for continuous catch-up. We recommend continue vaccinated both girls and boys, the gender neutral, within the school framework, and to start vaccinating at age nine. Uh, re regarding the religious leader, to update them that HPV infection can harm fertility and indirectly cause preterm birth. That will maybe uh, encourage them to get vaccinated. We also discussed simplifying the vaccination journey, as I just said, allowing nurses to prescribe and vaccinated, to introduce the vaccine in the travel clinic. We have travel clinics for Israelis before they go to travel various uh, countries. Vaccinate those diagnosed already with HPV carrier status or a precancerous condition caused by HPV, like in Portugal. Vaccinate without an upper age limit currently the upper age limit in Israel is 45 years of age, and we would like to give it without an upper limit for many reasons, because quite a few uh, persons need a vaccine even after 45. Regarding screening, uh, we would like that 70% of the women will undergo the HPV test every five years. We change it with the HPV test from three every three years to every five years. Uh, introduce self-sampling for HPV testing for populations who have not undergone cervical screening in the last five years because they won't come, or those who have difficulty accessing a clinic for screening. We have started with self-sampling mainly as a pilot, but I think that it has a place for those who would not come otherwise. Provide HPV vaccination to cervical screening screening time, the HPV faster when they come for screening, add the HPV vaccination at the same time. Screening for anal cancer and vaginal cancer in risk groups. Uh, we also had a recommendation regarding treatment and a recommendation regarding promotion of public and professional awareness of HPV issues, uh, which are unique to Israel. And all that uh, document have been uh, provided to the uh, health ministry, and we are waiting for uh, 
they're accepting it and adapting it. So I covered all my points. Thank you very much for your attention. So I'll, I'll try to direct. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I will direct each question to an expert. Uh, uh, I'll read from the Q&A and, and questions that were asked. Uh, but any speaker who wants to weigh in, uh, please hit the raise button, the raise hand button, and I'll bring you into the discussion. Here is a question about some new treatment for cervical HPV and low-grade SIL, uh, like papillocare. What is your experience with it? Could that be a game changer in getting rid of HPV-related? So. For that question, I would like to ask Dr. Gabi Aran to, uh, to talk, because I know that he was investing it uh, quite extensively. Dr. Aran? Yes, thank you. Um, well, I can say about the papillo care that, uh, first of all, we need to know that uh, this treatment is a treatment that can, uh, well, firstly, enhance the ability of the immune system to react to the HPV. Um, and uh, it uh, goes by three ways of uh, enhancing it. First of all, it enhances the repetilization of the cervix and the vagina. It uh, changes the microbiome of the of the vagina in order for it uh, to uh, react better for the uh, HPV, and it changes the non-inflammatory uh, su survival of uh, of the HPV. But I think that the most effective uh, um, way that the H that the papillo can react to the HPV is by changing the stress amount of the patient that takes it. I think that the way that you need uh, to react when, when you get the, um, the news that you have HPV, the way that patients usually react is by a, a very high stress uh, reaction. To be in charge of their situation. And this way, they lower the stress uh, reaction. And uh, we know that stress is not good for the immune system. And we see that the um, reaction is better when they have something to treat it with. Thank uh, you. Uh, may, may I ask uh, uh, the other, uh, the other uh, lecturers, what is your experience with those HPV treatments like uh, papillocare? care? Uh, do, do any of the other uh, have experience? Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Pedro Vieira Baptista first, and yeah. then Professor Bakni. Okay, I, I can agree with Dr. Gabby that some women, they really want to do something, but their disappointment, their frustration is even higher when they return positive, having spent a lot of money in, in a treatment. Personally, I, I have no experience, but uh, the study supporting, I, I'm I'm not a fan of, of those studies. I think they have uh, quite uh, some flaws uh, that prevent us from recommending it. And my proposal was to say that there's a recently pa published paper, position paper from ESGO about the use of probiotics and prebiotics in gynecological cancers. And it addressed also uh, HPV infection, cervical cancer, and the papillo care and the current recommendation from ESGO is that there is no evidence at the moment to recommend it. But I can agree for some patients, if they want to use it, it won't hurt except for their wallets. Thank you, Professor Bakhnin, and then Professor McGee. Um, I agree. In, in uh, uh, As I use it, for, again, for very uh, small uh, group of patients which are have a lot of stress and they want to do something and I think because it doesn't hurt and it might be having some a good effect uh, I suggest it but very much to a very small group of patients and for a low uh, LSIL and not uh, higher than that. Thank you Dr. Mergi. Yes, we had this discussion during the last IFTPC meeting in Colombia, <clears throat> and 
most of the speakers think that for the moment there is no evidence that this there is no medical treatment efficient against HPV infection. For the moment, there is no efficient treatment. And I, we know that if you have an HPV infection, you have a different microbiome, a vaginal microbiome than the other woman. And we know also that we have a preterm uh, possibility, even if we are not treated by a LETS or a laser or anything, because you have an HPV infection, so microbiome is different, and then you have a special risk of having a premature labor. Then we know that the microbiome of the vagina is quite different in HPV positive patient. And if you modify this microbiome, you could improve the immunity, but we doesn't know how long it 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 remains. And we we have seen so, uh, some papers showing that if you stop the treatment, you stop the microbiome modification, then the microbiome return to this initial issue. And then I'm not sure that those treatments are long-term efficient in HPV infection or low-grade disease. And I, I share the same idea that the Dr. Vieira Batista Pedro. Pedro, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Well, there were a couple of uh, papers or studies showing some uh, evidence that uh, uh, popular care uh, can make the change. Uh, so I look forward to see more more studies. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, they will convince uh, those who are uh, not convinced yet. Professor Vaknin, you wanted to add? I only wanted to add that there is issues that we have also to consider in patients which has a, a bit of chronic infection, which is like stopping smoking, which is, uh, I think, even more important than uh, other things. And cheaper. Yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> okay, Dr. Uh, Tati. Yes, I, I agree that stop smoking is the first issue that you must uh, say to the patient and uh, to papillo care. I, I, I read the Paloma study, which is the, the huge paper from the particular care, and the index of cure is no more than 60%. This is what you can expect in some patients, not in, in immunosuppressed patients, you know? But I think there, there would be uh, another studies about papillo care. Sometimes there is a lot, a lot of conflict of interest. We need a longer study, a longer period. Yes. Right, yes. right. Uh, I know that in Greece they talk a lot about lifestyle. So, uh, Dr. Bilirakis, uh, what is your position? Well, uh, I think that uh, there are women uh, having plain HPV infection, even without any lesion at all. And they're asking for something. So, we have used popular care. So, if it is a habitual regression, or if it is something for real, I can't say anything because there are no enough data. But the question is, do we have something to lose if we provide public care? Money. Well, okay. Uh, okay, Dr. Carlos. I, I agree with Dr. Vieira, with Pedro, that uh, we not uh, enough support and we have now a lot of products like Papillocare, who promotes uh, uh, HPV regression or inclusive lesion. So <laughs> we need more evaluation and more studies because, uh, for example, in, uh, in Colombia, we have uh, now Papillocare and we have uh, deflagene that is selenita plus uh, citric acid. And it's, it's a lot of uh, uh, products for the next year. And we need to have more studies to, to give an advice about that. You know, I would say we need to keep an open mind because when the vaccine was introduced, not everybody was happy and uh, 
<laughs> so that it will work. So and, and things have changed completely. Dr. Freeman, uh, Freeman Wang. Um, yes, I am. Um, we have some patients who have used uh, papilla care. Um, uh, and I agree, I think we do need more evidence, but I, like you, do think it's important to be open-minded. Um, completely anecdotally, I have three or four patients who have had biopsy proven high-grade disease who have refused to have standard treatment and have then gone on to either use that or medicinal mushrooms. So they've used reishi, shikake, coriolis, uh, cordyceps. And um, uh, bizarrely, although they've agreed to return and have biopsies, in all of them, though it has taken a year to 18 months, their lesion has regressed. Now, I can't tell you whether those would be lesions that would regress anyway. And on the basis of my three or four patients, I wouldn't uh, change or advise that that's standard treatment. But these are women, intelligent women, who have chosen not to go by the conventional route but have agreed to be monitored. Um, so I think there's something in it, but I think it needs more evaluation and research. Thank you so much. So let's move uh, to another issue. First, thank you very much for all your presentations, which gave us a lot of ideas and tips on how uh, to increase the compliance. Uh, we haven't talked much about the partners, the male partners of uh, of, the, of our women. Uh, so the question that uh, came is, should a partner of a woman diagnosed with HPV 16 and CIN1 be referred for HPV vaccination? Uh, is, I, I know there are no guidelines, but what is your opinion? Um, may I start with uh, Elma? <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you. <clears throat> That's an important question we uh, hear on a daily basis in our offices and outpatient clinics. Uh, there are some data from Canada, uh, which are certainly preliminary, but they indicate that uh, the vaccine also might uh, limit the transmission. And since we know that partners of HPV positive persons are at risk for developing disease, it's certainly a point to discuss the vaccine, even if we don't have strong data, but just using our common clinical sense, it makes use. And I usually discuss this with my patients and also their partners and uh, a substantial proportion also takes the vaccine then and I, I think we can give a recommendation even without strong data at the moment. Thank you. Do any of oh, uh, Dr. Murgi? I would like to ask a question to Elma Juro, <laughs> just in case we saw that you are proposing, and most of the people representing has proposed to vaccine patient after the age of the vaccination initially, after 20 years old, after 30 years old, after 40 years old then. And you say that uh, ca Canadian presentation says that you can vaccine men which are uh, have a relation with a woman infected by an HPV. And then you think that it could be efficient then. But I see in the lay study published in the New England and in the, some UK studies that more you are vaccinating younger, more efficient you are in terms of invasive cervical cancer, invasive. And then do you think that it's really efficient to vaccinate patient after 30, 40 years old, or even after 25 years old and I thought that in the in the publication you show in your presentation that the efficiency after 17 years old was much less in, um, efficient than uh, than before. Um, yes, that's that's a really important question, and uh, the problem is uh, we come to different results when we uh, talk about a vaccination program, and that's very clear 
that the earlier we vaccinate, the more benefit we get out of the money we're investing in that program. And I think uh, the consideration of Israel to go to the age of nine with uh, the vaccine is uh, a good consideration. And we did the same thing in Austria. But looking at the individual patient, so having a 35-year-old woman in front of you and she wants to get the best protection, then we can say, well, in the clinical trials, looking at uh, individual patients, when this woman is at the moment uh, negative for HPV negative in general or for most of the types, then we can have clear data that she's protected in the future against infections with the other types and also with against reinfections with the same type. So uh, our patients, we can counsel in that way. If we are uh, counseling public health or the Ministry of Health, uh, then uh, it's quite clear that we should opt for the young age. And th that's a complex thing, but that's the data we have. Do you have an age li a limit of age to vaccinate? Uh, we recommend it actively up to the age of 45, since we have data up to the age of 45. But in Europe, we don't have any uh, upper age limit uh, in the license. So uh, after the age of 45, we uh, do it permissive. So if someone wants to get protection, uh, we vaccinate. OK. When we continue with the question, I see that uh, a few of the questions were answered in writing by the panel members, so I encourage the audience to go and see the answered questions. I won't go into those who were answered because we are short of time. <clears throat> I'd like to read some of the open questions. Uh, Dr. Nina Madnani from uh, India, thank you for participating. She mentioned that in India, the screening for cervical cancer is 1%. Oh, yeah. uh, 1%. <laughs> It is uh, very low. Dr. Uh, Murgi, you are in charge of the world as uh, president of the IFCPC. What uh, steps are taken in India or in other low-income countries uh, to increase uh, screening and vaccination? Well, I am not in charge of India, of course, as you know. <laughs> I am not in charge of the world. In, yeah, in charge of the data, yeah. Organize communication between countries in the world to improve cervical cancer prevention and mostly HPV-related disease preventions. Then in low-income countries or middle-income countries, I'm sure that we have a, a lot of work to do. And I think that the most important thing to do is really to improve vaccination because we have a lack of uh, pathology services to HPV testing. And perhaps I will show you in my conclusion, because I have some slides to conclude this webinar, you, you asked me to do that. Then I would say that perhaps in the future, we could use AI, artificial intelligence, in order to do HPV testing and perhaps to help to cervical disease uh, visualization or identification. Great idea. Uh, here is somebody who asked, uh, what is the role of vaccinating with a non-avalent HPV vaccine persons previously vaccinated with a quadrivalent, uh, especially when they get diagnosed with a new CIN1? I know it's an issue that uh, we can spend uh, two hours talking about it, but any one of you would like to answer that one. Does anybody? Yeah. Dr. Mergi, yeah. Elma. I let, I let Elma answering this question. Elma, you start. Much uh, better. Yeah, we know that uh, the five additional types of the nine valent vaccine are especially important in older women. So over the age of 50, um, we see a lot of cancer related to HPV 33, and it also pays off to... Um, get a good protection against HB45 um, causing some adenocarcinomas of the cervix. Uh, 
Well, when you're vaccinated in the program with the bivalent or quadrivalent vaccine, so you, you already have a very good protection. If you want the best protection, uh, you could discuss it to get it out of pocket. It probably pays off, but certainly also on an individual basis. And if you have a CN1, a low-grade lesion, yeah, uh, you should also get get the vaccine. As we know, uh, also those being infected and those with disease, they benefit from the vaccine. Let me remind you that in Sweden, uh, the program is giving everybody at the time of the first screening to give the non-avalent vaccine, nev never mind if she has already received the quadrivalent vaccines because of the 20% additional protection. Yeah. Uh, Pedro. Just a very personal perspective. Uh, and it is, For most patients now, it is obviously out of pocket. But I tend to recommend it very actively to women at risk of uh, having a transplant or having the need for some immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, women with lichen planus, for instance, uh, I always recommend it, but it's obviously no guidelines on that as far as I know. It's just a personal perspective. Thank you very much. I must say that within the question and answer, many uh, Thank you all speakers for their uh, talks and thank us for the uh, organizing of the webinar. And as I said, most of the questions were uh, answered uh, already, so I won't go uh, go into more questions. Um, I see a question by Dr. Durand. Thank you for participating in Israel uh, in HPV faster scheme. Is vaccination funded to age of 45? or just to 26. So in Israel, I will answer that one, uh, Nancy. Um, uh, it is in the health basket, means it is fully or almost fully uh, covered until the age of 26 as of now. Uh, between ages 26 to 45, it is uh, funded partially. Uh, so at a reasonable uh, payment, they can receive it up to age of uh, 45. Thank you for your question. Uh, what else? Um, I think we covered the other questions. So, okay, let me see if there's another one. Okay, here is a question. Where are we in terms of HPV screening in the male population? You know, um, screening uh, in the male population is much more difficult. Uh, do any of you send your patients for screening or high-risk groups for screening? And what kind of HPV screening? Mario, do you have experience? Well, there are no validated uh, tests for screening for male. And so the finding of particular HPV doesn't mean a risk of uh, intrapetelial penile or anal intrapetelial uh, neoplasia. So, uh, more than 20 years ago, we started to screen uh, male partners, and uh, more than 50% were different for uh, women. And so, uh, we increase the risk of divorce, uh, separating couple, and so we stopped to screen uh, men after CIN diagnosis. Of course, we uh, have to uh, send male partners if uh, there are HPV uh, uh, 6 and 11 um, lesions, so condylomatous lesion, to give to a dermatologist to uh, avoid the recurrence uh, treating the male uh, HPV-related lesion, but not HPV DNA screening. And uh, Elma. Uh, the problem with uh, HPV testing in men is we have no algorithm how to deal with the result. And we know from uh, Anna Giuliano that men are positive up to 50% at any age. So the likelihood to find a positive test is very high. And we can only say inshallah and nothing else. So that's very unsatisfactory. And 
for that reason, we strongly discourage to test men first. Dr. Mergi? Yes, I agree with this conclusion because the, the burden of uh, HPV-related cancer in men are, is 10% of the burden of, the, of cancer in women. So the main problem for men is uh, oropharyngeal cancer, and there is, at the moment, no meaning of detection, prevention, or, uh, or treatment, of course, we have when the cancer is, is uh, uh, diagnosed, but there is no meaning to prevent any uh, oropharyngeal cancer. An HPD testing of the, of the oral cavity is not efficient, then I think it's not efficient at the moment to detect men, even if the, the women are positive. And I, I'm not sure that using condoms is efficient to, to prevent any reinfection because in, HPV infection can be transmitted by digital and not only by uh, 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 sexual uh, penetration, you know. I would say that we need guidelines in this area, even though we don't have evidence-based yet, but uh, experts can, you know, uh, express their opinion and, and some guidelines are needed because I get many questions and everybody is uh, acting in a different way. Elma, you want uh, to add anything? Uh, you're muted, probably. Probably. Sorry, no, um, uh, I agree with that. Yeah, and so we don't recommend uh, condoms. And uh, there are some data which show a mild effect, but it's more stigmatization. And so we want to keep it relaxed. So we recommend vaccination in that um, scenario, but not condoms. All right, there are quite a few more questions, but our time is running up. So I apologize to all those uh, whose questions were not answered. Uh, I think that one conclusion is that we need more webinars like that because there are many questions from all over the world. We had participants from many countries, uh, people from Ghana, from uh, Azerbaijan, from India, all expressed their uh, thanks for our um, our webinar. And again, I apologize uh, to those who, whom we couldn't, we didn't have enough time to uh, to answer the question. And now, as we wrap up, I want to give huge thanks to our speakers for their brilliant talks, answering our questions, and joining the discussion. Thank to the audience. And to close things off, I'll hand it over to Dr. Mergui for some final words and conclusion. Jean Luc. Do you have my screen? Yes. Yes, yes oh. we can see you. Then in conclusion, I want, of course, thanks to the, the Israeli organization for the, this webinar. It was very interesting and showing a lot, a large number of countries worldwide. And we may see that in, in conclusion, in high income countries, the WHO goal to could be realistic to to vaccine ninety percent of young girls, to screen seventy percent of women, and to treat ninety percent of women, and we have to insist to this related to, but also to recognize. Told you a few seconds before then we had a very important increase of HPV related cancer in men in oropharyngeal area and to in, to increase the, the vaccination we have to be very efficient we know that this vaccine is very efficient for hpv incidence it's efficient for to to prevent any vaginal and vulvar hpv disease and cancer and pre-cancer in those patients and the treatment of those cancer is very is, is a, it could be a disaster for for women we have to insist, of course, to the neutral gender of the vaccination, which can help. And in my country, for example, in France, we have a very high problem to vaccine people. And I think that the neutral gender of vaccination could help countries to 
increase the number of patients vaccinated. And perhaps in the future, we may have some evidence, uh, scientific evidence that one dose is sufficient. And perhaps if one dose is sufficient, perhaps we could increase the vaccination in girls and boys. The second step is to increase screening, and we see that we saw that in France, but also in UK, but we see also in other country, and then even, for example, in in Greece, that the screening is not completely coverage. But we don't have a uh, sufficient coverage of the, of the population, and we have to improve information to population, and perhaps the future could be in self-sampling. We didn't discuss about self-sampling today, but we will have another webinar to discuss about how to increase screening and how could the self-sampling could help us in detecting HPV-related disease. For the other country, we had the example of you know, South America, Argentina, and Colombia. And for middle and low-income country, we have the question of the, uh, uh, the gynecologist from India. The problem is the availability and the price of the vaccines and to have a, a, a coverage of vaccination and the help of national health systems to help people to be vaccinated. The second problem is the HPV test and pathology services, not services with a cervix, but services as a service. Uh, and the, perhaps to help that, uh, I told you that perhaps the future will be the role for artificial intelligence. And we know now that we could help you know, as a low income country for HPV testing with a, a, a immunoluminescence test who could decide if the patient is, um, is HPV infected by HPV 16, 18. And this test in the future could be helpful for low income country because it's very, very, um, economic, and uh, for one dollar you could, could have an HPV test, and perhaps the detection of lesion in low-income country, which don't have any access to colposcopy, could be helped by colposcopic uh, AI substitution tools. Could help gynecologists or even not gynecologists, even nurses to identify which person, which patient has to be treated or uh, to be followed. That was my conclusion for today. We have a very worldwide problem, which were quite different between high and low income countries, which has not, not the same problem and not the same tools to treat and to screen patients. Thank you very much. Jacob for organizing such a, a meeting with very interesting topics. And personally, I hope for you to have peace and have a, a better moment for Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. We appreciate uh, every one of you and your support. Thank you. Have a nice evening and see you soon. Out. Thank you. Bye. Bye.